Hello, everyone, and welcome to our first guest speaker session. This is Engineer, your puzzle master from yesterday, and the co-host of today's speaker session. And I would like to welcome Tin Show. I feel like you need no introduction. I'll, uh, I'll let him introduce himself actually a little bit, uh, maybe what he's uh, currently watching in the space, or you can also ask him questions after because we will be saving a lot of time for questions. Uh, this is an excellent opportunity to hear from someone who's not just reviewed one or two contracts, but has looked at many, many contracts. So uh, good opportunity to prepare questions on what the auditor lifestyle is like. And with that, I'll pass the mic over to you, Tincho. Beautiful. Thank you. Thank you for having me. Hi, everyone. I'm Tincho. Um, yeah, the idea for today is, uh, as we were saying, doing a brief talk, hopefully 30 minutes, more or less. I will be kind of sharing my views, comments, opinions, uh, thoughts on what auditing is for me. And um, then uh, the idea is to have like plenty of time for discussions, thoughts, your comments, your opinions, many questions that you might have, you might not have like whatever you want to discuss, I'm open. Um, so yeah, my background is on, I used to be a penetration tester before being a Solidity Auditor, and then I jumped into Open Zeppelin, and I worked at Open Zeppelin uh, for more than three years as a lead auditor. So I audited from the pre-DeFi stuff. And when I started, we didn't have any DeFi. I think Compound was only getting started and Ogor, that kind of things. That was 2018 more or less. And then, uh, well, I went through the whole uh, token madness, then DeFi stuff, then layer twos and so on and so forth. So had plenty of opportunities to break and not break many protocols out there. Um, always as a, as a lead editor or open Zeppelin. And then I quit and I'm now uh, an independent security researcher in the space doing back hunting, security reviews and other stuff that I might not say too much. Uh, hopefully soon I can share more on what I'm doing uh, currently. So I think that's enough introduction. Um, I will jump to some slides that I have prepared and you should be seeing it now. Perfect. So it's uh, audit like you mean it, okay? The idea is sharing why I think auditing matters, okay? I don't think auditing a smart contract is uh, just a regular job. I think that we have a responsibility in the Ethereum ecosystem as security auditors. Hopefully I can share my views on that. I can convince you on that so that when we say we are auditors, we have a proud for it. We can really mean that we are making Ethereum safer. Okay. I want you to have that idea. I have always had that idea and that idea has been the one that has been driving me from day one to always be a little better auditor in the space. Right. I really think that we should audit things like we really mean it. Like we have a purpose, purpose behind us and we want to make things safer for Ethereum. Okay. Um, I know I won't convince everybody about that idea, but hopefully I can share with you um, some thoughts on what auditing is not, how, what's the mindset uh, to be an auditor, why it matters, and so on and so forth. And then we can uh, talk about your views, your backgrounds, your opinions, and whatnot, right? So why? Why do I say that uh, auditing matters? Uh, well, because I think that Ethereum matters. I think that each one of us may have different reasons on why Ethereum is important, okay? For some of us, uh, for some of, of the people here, might be the technology, just uh, the, like the, the engineering part of it. For some others, might be like the ethos of the community. For some others, might be like financial incentives that you have in Ethereum. For some others, might be the decentralization, transparency, and democracy that it can bring to um, the society as a whole. I don't know. Everybody has its reasons, but I think that uh, hopefully for all of our, for all of us, Ethereum is a thing that we should be protecting. Ethereum is a thing uh, that matters for all of us. So we must make it a safer place. We really must ensure that the application layer of Ethereum is a safer place. It is not today. Clearly, I won't 
uh, list every single hat that happened. I won't be talking about numbers. We are all aware of that. And that's why we are here. I really think that if we want Ethereum to succeed, we must make very strong efforts on protecting the application layer of Ethereum. I mean, basically smart contracts that are deploying Ethereum, right? I think that we have the base layer on Ethereum, which is pretty secure already. Of course, we should be continuously making efforts of that as well. But if we are auditors of smart contracts, we are probably focusing on smart contract stuff, right? Uh, so in the application layer. So hopefully one day the application layer of Ethereum will be as robust and, and, and developed with a with a security first mindset as the base layer. So I, I don't think that's the case. So we really should be focusing on making things far more secure, right? So as auditors, I think we should we should have some uh, of that responsibility. In the process, you will choose your own adventure, right? You will work for in different ways. You might be an independent auditor. You might work for an auditing firm. You might work with your friends. You might decide to do back hunting instead. You might decide to do, I don't know, contests, contests instead. I don't know. You will choose different ways of contributing to the state of security. Hopefully you will. Hopefully you will make an impact. Hopefully together as a security community, we can make Ethereum safer, right? So let me give you some advice regardless of, of that path that you take. Probably I will mention, uh, I will be very focusing on what auditing means to me, right? First thing that I should say is auditing is never enough, okay? It's not bulletproof. The work that you are going to do is not bulletproof. It's not that you are the sole barrier between hackers and a protocol. You're just yet another layer of the security of a code base, okay? You can contribute to make it safer, but it won't be enough, right? There's lots of efforts that need to be done to secure a system beyond just uh, reading the solidity code and saying whether a function is secure or not, right? There are many other things contributing to security, so it's never enough. Take it, take your job with a pinch of salt saying, okay, I will make my, my best effort to this, but I know that it won't be enough. These developers, this project should be continuously thinking about security beyond this single audit that I'm doing, right? Because as auditors, you have limited time, you have a limited scope in the things that you're reviewing and you have limited knowledge, right? You don't know it all, clearly. I don't know, you know, nobody knows it all. So you're just making an effort in a couple of weeks to review a couple of smart contracts from, I don't know, a thousand to 10,000 solid lines of code, whatever you name it, with the knowledge that you currently have and you will make your best effort to review that, okay? In this limited amount of time, you will do your best with hopefully all you got to, uh, be able to break the code, to, to be able to uh, find any security vulnerabilities, some uh, quality assurance recommendations, and so on and so forth to make the code safer, okay? But remember, it's not enough. You're just making your best effort, and that's fine. You're not bulletproof. No, I don't expect you to be bulletproof. You shouldn't be putting that uh, pressure on your shoulders. If crypto Twitter wants to say something else, let them say something else. And you will fail in the process. Okay, that's interesting. Um, again, you are not bulletproof. So that means that while you can provide some security, some assurances that you have reviewed the code, that you have made your best efforts to review a code base, that perhaps it's more secure now because you have reported a couple of bugs, critical bugs, hopefully, whatever, but you may not find everything, right? You may not find everything. So there would be issues that you'll miss. There will be issues in out of scope parts that you didn't audit or that you didn't have time to audit or that nobody paid you to audit. There will be issues when developers deploy stuff. There will be issues in web to infrastructure stuff like I don't know DNS hijacking and that kind of things. Key management stuff, of course, is pretty dangerous. Nobody is auditing uh, that kind of security, like kind of, that kind of sorry, that kind of practices uh, to manage uh, private keys. There might be issues in things that you don't know it, but finally end up affecting uh, the systems that you audited, right? There might be issues in the compiling, in the best layer, like, like there might be issues everywhere. So you will make your best efforts in securing a couple of thousands lines of code to solidity, but it might be a case that you will fail because that's never enough. And this is, I, I mean, and even, and even if you make your best efforts, there will be things that are really out of your hands, 
okay? Sometimes developers, users will make mistakes themselves. Even if we recommend them to do the opposite, the, to be safe, to not follow certain practices, they will fail, they will make mistakes and uh, shit will happen. So remember, uh, nothing is bulletproof. We, we are just making our best here. And this mindset of I don't know it all is something that has been on my head since day, since day one, since I was an auditor. I really mean that auditing is really about learning things every day. You will learn lots of things in Y Academy, but you will need to continuously be learning every single day when you are an auditor. Okay, so you should be embracing failure, knowing that well, if I don't know it all, if I and, and I need to be able to make my best effort because I want to secure this application because this application is built on top of Ethereum and Ethereum matters, then I will embrace failure and I will continuously learn, just fucking learn every single day. I will continuously be improving my skills. I will play CTS. I will read articles. I will do courses. I will talk to people. I will do audits. I will do backhand, like whatever you want to do it and always be sharpening your skills because auditing is always about learning. Many times you will find yourself being the auditor of a project that have certain components that you're not familiar with, right? It might be, for instance, I know the case of a layer two thing that you don't know very well how a layer two is supposed to work. But at least in the beginning, you should take some prep time to read about layer two, to find every single issue uh, that was published around layer two to be able to know whether that applies or not to the system that you're about to audit, in documentation, like whatever is out there that you can learn from and then do the audit. And the same happens with DeFi stuff, governance stuff, DAOs stuff. Um, there's always things that you will not know. Like for instance, if they're using a new EIP and you're not familiar with it, but well, you will need to have some time during the audit or perhaps before the audit while you are preparing for it to be able to learn it, okay? And it's not that you shouldn't be editing that thing because you don't know about it. Perhaps you should be clear with your customers that, well, I, might, I am familiar with it, I'm not an expert on it, but I will learn about it and I will provide an audit for it, okay? So it's very much about learning. I, it's, I cannot tell you how many things I learned because I was an auditor, okay? It's, a, it's Sometimes it feels like people are, are paying you just for learning, which is pretty cool. But well, there, then there are all responsibilities which take the fun away. Take, take the fun away. But anyway, um, in the process of being an auditor, please don't be many things. I want to share with you some ideas of things that you shouldn't be while you audit stuff. Okay, so don't be a friend. Sometimes uh, we as auditors tend to relate too much with developers in the sense that we will kind of a trusting relationship and. Um, if we do that, we shouldn't be losing our independence as auditors, okay? We shouldn't be compromising too much on the things that uh, we value, that we stand on, that we think are valuable for the security of a project. Even if we are auditing uh, the code for know, our developer friends, blah, 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 they don't, like, we should be a little bit more adversarial. We should be uh, finding issues, we should be reporting, we shouldn't be compromising on the things that we want to say as auditors just because we are acquaintances with the developers that we are auditing, right? But having said that, I mean, we should, having said that you should be some somewhat adversarial and you audit stuff, you shouldn't be an enemy, okay? It's not that you shouldn't be collaborating. On the other hand, you should be really collaborative with the thing that, with the developers, you should be providing value, you should be responsible, you should be thoughtful in your advice, you should be helpful if there is any problem. Um, we sh really should be building a, a trusting relationship between auditors and developers, always, always maintaining this kind of independence between the two, but at the same time, knowing that, well, I'm going to be adversarial, but yeah, I'm, I, I also need to be helpful and collaborative, okay? So also don't be an enemy. Uh, we are working together at, at the end of the day to, to make Ethereum safer. And please don't be in a stamping machine. Like at some point you will get a chance to work for a company and you can decide where you where you can work or perhaps you fund your own auditing company, whatever. Uh, but please don't become a stamping machine. I think this industry uh, has 
been to some extent damaged by some auditors or security firms that uh, provide that appear to provide greater uh, security uh, security assurances that they should uh, given these stamps and certificates of uh, that something is secure forever i don't think we should be doing that i think that we should be always looking at security as this continuous process that we should be always making things safer and and there is no point in which we can uh, guarantee that a system is 100% secure okay so let's be mindful about it let's be responsible um the image of the security industry is uh the responsibility of all of us um so please don't be a stamping machine so recap like be adversarial but also be collaborative be thoughtful be responsible don't be a stamping machine okay that that's lots of the mindset that i have had throughout these years to, while i was auditing okay and I have been mentioning the word auditing a lot, and we say that we are auditors and that we audit, we audit the stuff, right? And I think there's a consensus already in the ecosystem that, well, auditing is actually not auditing. I'm going to talk about it later, but it's actually like providing a, a code assessment, a security uh, from a security mind, with a security mindset, being a little bit adversarial, trying to find bugs, uh, trying to understand what's the state of security of a code base so as to be able to provide a recommendation and advice on how to improve that over the time with short, mid and long term uh, recommendations, right? Uh, and everything is done as a best effort in a limited amount of time with a, with a limited scope, right? Um, but everything is not just running a tool, right? And don't think that if you're uh, learning to use a slither, you will just run a slither and uh, be able to uncover every single bug or whatever. I'm, I'm just saying a slither because it's the, the tool that came to mind, but there are many others. I think they are very much complementary to our work. They're super valuable. There's room to use them, definitely. I'm not saying don't, don't use tools, but I'm saying auditing is a process that is much more just running a tool, okay? There's lots of manual things to be done. There's also, you can use your brain as a tool and you should be thinking and you should be discussing with your peers and so on. So you should have a kind of, of this complementary approach between manual and automatic uh, security reviews. It's also not about hunting. So there's this, perhaps there's this misconception in some people that uh, every auditor can be a back hunter and every back hunter can be an auditor. I think they are two different approaches to make to doing security in the ecosystem. Uh, when we do audits, I really think that we should be providing a far more comprehensive assessment of the code base. Okay, back hunters will only go to one certain place and find one, one vulnerability and be able to exploit that and report that. But as auditors, we should be making far more comprehensive recommendations of the, the state of security of a code base, okay? So don't confuse those two. Um, if you just, you can take whatever report uh, of a back hunting platform like Immunify, and you can take whatever report of a serious um, auditing firm, and you will realize that, that there are many differences on that, right? You will see a far more comprehensive um, detail in an audit report that you won't see in, in a back hunting report. Also, auditing is not incident response. I want to be very clear on this. Sometimes there is this expectation in that um, because you are an auditor and you have audited something and, and an issue happened, a hack happened, you should be jumping immediately to do incident response and, and the incident response, response process is your full responsibility. And I will say no to that, okay? I really think that, well, it will at the end of the day depend on the agreement, right? That you had with your client and what you, whatever thing you signed at the beginning. If you promised that you would do incident response, well, probably you should be doing that. Um, but this idea that right from the start, auditors are people skilled on incident response, I don't think that's true, okay? Incident response requires a very particular set of skills to handle stress, to be able to um, very quickly uh, 
program things, to deploy things on mainnet, to send transactions, um, to deal with clients, to be able to operate in a war room, and so on and so forth, that not every auditor necessarily has the skill for that. Not, not is interested in that, right? Many people doing incident response are on call during weekends, and perhaps you're an auditor and you on the weekend, you just want to be relaxing and chilling on the park, and you don't want to be doing incident response, okay? So if you didn't agree with that with your customers, I think that you should be helpful in the process if you can. Yes, you can collaborate with them, definitely, because you're a partner. Um, but having said that, well, you should be uh, sensible around your decisions and the things that you commit yourself to do. Um, also, auditing is not quality assurance, okay? So some auditors at the beginning, and this might be the case for some more junior auditors sometimes, depending on your background, if you come from like QA and uh, sorry, QA and testing background, it might be the case that you as an auditor just want to report um, medium or low stuff or things related to gas efficiency and so on and so forth. That there is room to, to include that in your reports, definitely. Um, like more informational recommendations on, on code quality and so on. But always remember that as security auditors, we should. Like the priority should be security issues. Okay, we should be adversarial towards the code and we should be finding security vulnerabilities. There might be cases in which we don't find them, obviously, and we will also provide um, recommendations around code quality. Yes, definitely. It's a mixture of both, but the priority should always be um, security related things. And um, in the process, you might write, for instance, tests. Uh, and, and proof of concept exploit and so on. So definitely there, there is room to bring some skills from QA to uh, security auditing. But remember, when we do it, we really want to be focusing on security stuff uh, and not only on like more functional things or uh, code quality things, okay? So we should be comprehensive in that sense as well. And auditing is not auditing okay auditing i mean if you come from the web 2 more traditional world you might be confused or some people might be confused that i know probably you will see this a lot on crypto twitter um that auditors should be legally um, uh, liable for the things that they audit and the reports that they write and so on i don't think that's true i think that uh, and, and there is already uh, some consensus on the, at least on the security industry, uh, the smart contract security industry about this, in that we are not real auditors, okay? We are not like the traditional um, financial or legal auditors that, uh, should, that, are, that should follow a certain type of rules and should abide uh, by law to certain uh, independence and, and, and and the way they behave with uh, the relationship they have with their customers and so on and so forth. So this is like a smart contract security and auditing is very different from that, right? We are just uh, people skilled on, on security things that are providing a service on how to uh, understand the state of security of a system and provide recommendations on that to make it safe, right? We don't intend to be real auditors. Um, it's just we have a bad uh, naming on that. At some point we should change it for something uh, cooler. I don't know. Security reviewers could be one, but it's not that cool. Anyway, um, auditing is not like auditing, right? And it's not madness. Um, I, I want to also to make a strong point here in that I've seen lots of auditors come and go, um, myself included. I have come and go from auditing. And I understand how tiring and stressing auditing can be, okay? I don't know if you have done um, real audits out there um, with people paying you to do that, and that is something that is about to be deployed on mainnet or that is already deployed on mainnet and has billions of dollars deposited on it. But hopefully at some point, if your career grows into the auditing world, well, you might get to that point. And there's definitely pressure on your shoulders, okay? You will feel it. You will realize that, well, if you make a mistake during the audit and you miss a critical bug, millions of dollars could be lost. So that, that definitely takes a toll on you. Um, and hopefully it won't drive you mad, okay? I really think that uh, mental health of auditors is a, an important topic. You should be taking care of yourself. 
of your peers. You should be taking rests between audits. You should be taking it easy. You should be going slowly. You should take some time away from auditing to do more like other stuff that you want to do, research, education, communication, um, playing CTF, like whatever takes you out of the auditing zone and, and the whole pressure of auditing to do something else. And then once you have learned something new, for example, you can come back to audits again, right? Um, if you ever set up a, an auditing shop, Take this into account. If you make your auditors audit too much, too long, they will just burn out. They will just quit, right? And if you quit as an auditor, if you just don't want to do audits anymore, you won't want to look at any Solidity code any, any, anymore. It's a loss for the entire ecosystem, right? There's very few people, honestly, uh, working on security, uh, on smart contract security. We should be getting more and more people into the place. Um, so hopefully you will take auditing easy, uh, taking your time, being having a healthy work style, taking care of your of your mental health, and um, and helping your peers as well. Right? We don't want to lose you. Uh, don't quit. Um, take your time and keep contributing uh, to Ethereum. Right? Because Ethereum, as I was saying at the beginning, matters. Your skills for this ecosystem matter. We should be putting our skills to make the application layer of Ethereum far more secure than it is today. We have a big responsibility on that. We can make a huge impact on that. This industry is only getting started. There's lots of room to make many other things. Hopefully, we will, con we will be auditors and that contribute meaningfully to the state of security of Ethereum to make it better. And we audit like we really, really mean it. Okay. So that's it for my initial talk. Um, there you have my contact. You can find me as at Tim Chobate on Twitter, on GitHub. There is my blog, like notonlyowner.com. You can pick me, whatever you want. And we can chat uh, after afterwards, uh, whatever comment that you have. I'm open to that. And the idea now, I think that we have some time, is just to do an AMA, like whatever you have to comment ask, uh, say, um, like up to you. So yeah, thank you. And let's do it. Hey, do you have a strategy when it comes to like auditing big code base? A strategy in terms of uh, what, like how do I approach it? Like, um, like it's mentally easy to take care of like a single file, let's say. But when it comes to multiple files, like an entire project, let's say you have to review AV V3, um, you can have to have like a big mental map. And I think yep. you can be exhausted. Yes, uh, can be exhausting. Uh, probably you will have plenty of time to do that if you're auditing AV V3. Um, I know you should be auditing no, like a month. An extreme yeah. example. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, yeah I get it. Um, I what has helped me in my in my time as an auditor, which is related to the way I think. I'm very I'm kind of a visual thinker, so I draw I draw lots of diagrams. So I use Miro, um, which is a tool that lets you draw a lot of things with arrows and and connecting stuff and so on. So that helps me. Uh, have a comprehensive always a comprehensive view on the whole system like every I don't know every square will be a, a contract and I will kind of be drawing the calls and everything um so that helps me understand some interactions when the whole thing is too big okay and um then when it comes to the uh, how I approach a really big code base as uh, it will depend but usually perhaps you can start with the more encapsulated building blocks, like perhaps some libraries that they are using or like smaller contracts that then are imported in other bigger contracts. So once you go to a bigger contract, like the core contracts of a, of a protocol, you will have reviewed already like all the little building blocks and you can start treating them as black boxes because you have already reviewed them. And because they are encapsulated, that means that you can audit these little libraries without 
understanding the whole system. But as you do it, more and more of them, you will kind of build that knowledge around the whole system. And once you get to the core contracts of it, you will have uh, already kind of built your mental model about it, and you will be able to uh, audit the most important uh, parts of it. Some other people might do the opposite. Some other people might start with the uh, most important contracts, like the core contracts of a system. And there will be things that they don't understand at that point because they are missing uh, context on, on the little like satellite contracts that are around it. But they will take notes about it. Okay, I don't know this, I don't know that. Uh, they will ask questions and so on and so forth. And they will go through a whole uh, core contract. Then they will go to the libraries or satellite contracts. And then they will come back to the bigger contract to be able to um, answer the questions that they had at the beginning. Um, yep, I think that's kind of different strategies to that. Is there a, there's a question in the comments. Yes, I'm reading it. So what are the five things you would ask from this devs as an auditor? The five things. <laughs> Some people are more chatty, so they, they ask many more things than, than five. Um, I usually, at the beginning, I like having uh, developers do a, a co-walkthrough of the system. I usually ask them at the beginning to tell me things that they would say to a junior developer that they are onboarding to their code base. Let's say they are onboarding a junior dev. They probably have things like warnings to tell them about their code, saying like, oh no, you should be taking care of this contract because we didn't pay too much attention to that, or you should be looking at this because it is quite fragile and so on and so forth. So in that code walkthrough, you will realize that developers are more confident of certain parts of a code. They are less confident on other parts and you can start uh, taking it from there. So a code walkthrough is one of the very first things that I would ask. Some people might do it, some people might not, depending on how much time they have, but I, I find them um, quite useful. Other things that I ask is like, um, right from the start, I want them to tell me about the integrations that, we, that they have in their code. Sometimes even if I hadn't uh, looked at the code before, uh, I wanted to tell me like, yes, we are using this price oracle. Yes, we are integrating with Unisoft in this way or with Compound or whatever thing they are integrating with. Um, so that right from the start, I, I understand what am I what I am about to face, okay? I don't like like opening VS Code and being surprised uh, too many times. So, always asking developers uh, their integrations. It's a good thing. Another thing is uh, where they are running some tools, um, like for instance, static analyzers or fuzzing stuff, or um, I know formal verification stuff, so that you are kind of aware of where they have other layers of security or where they are expecting you to find everything because they are not doing anything else, right? In the, in, a, in the same line of thought, you could be asking them where they, they have like monitoring in place. You can ask them when they are launching because that's important, where they are expecting you to find every single thing this week and next week they are launching or where they are having audits with other uh, security firms. Um, what else? I would ask them what are they, uh, what, is, what is their biggest concern about the system? and what um, security threats they have already thought about and have disregarded, okay? It might be the case that in more experienced developers, you will find that they have already thought about um, things. And for, for many reasons, they have, I know, disregarded that or they have already included mitigations within the code. Uh, and that can save you time, you know, because it might be the case that you realize about a potential attack vector during the audit, and the developers have already thought about it. And well, you if you spent lots of time on it, well, you, you lost a lot of time just thinking about something that developers had already thought about. Uh, so asking them about 
uh, or mitigations that you already have in place, or more experienced developers can even explain some things about the threat model of their system. That's also cool to, to just talk about with developers at the beginning of an audit. Um, but yeah, I would I would go those ways. Cool, there's another one. Uh, where do you think most protocols fails from a security perspective? Hmm. Most protocols. I don't want to say everywhere. Um, after, after the years, I think that the basic solidity is tough. Uh, it's pretty much understood in the ecosystem, like for instance, unsafe external calls. So people know about reentrancy and that kind of things. Um, so I wish they didn't fail too much on that side because it's already a well-known pattern and, and attack vector, but I would say, that even sometimes uh, the basic stuff uh, is missing and they fail at it. Um, we are seeing lots of things around uh, management of private keys. Every now and then we see some protocol being hacked just because they didn't protect their private keys. I'm not an expert on like uh, that kind of uh, physical security of how our keys and everything. Um, but I think we should uh, we should be paying more attention to that. Um, then some developers also fail at understanding that auditors are not bulletproof. Uh, some people might put unrealistic expectations on what we auditors are expected to do. And I think that's a big failure because if you put unrealistic expectations on your auditors, it means that you won't be thinking of security as a as many layers uh, that you should be putting in place uh, for defense. So I think some probably junior or less experienced developers fail at that as well. Like believing that just uh, by fixing some, some audit report issues, you will be safe forever. I think that's a big failure. And then you have the usual, like, like I don't know, arithmetic things, applicability, governance, <laughs> Lots of things. Um, what tools do I recommend? Your mind is the first one, and discussing with your with your team. Um, I'm. Lots of the things that I've done is like. I think that the most interesting issues that I found is like just by manual review, like very thorough and deep manual review of things. Those are the most interesting and critical issues. Uh, so no tools for that. Um, but then I think there are tools like, I don't know, I think there's one called Surya will let you graph and do some diagrams and graph some stuff. Um, Slither as well uh, can be useful. Um, what else? At some point, I was like at the very beginning, I used Mithril, but I didn't like it too much. I hadn't used them, used it since, since then, so I don't know and what's the state of it. Um, and not so much really. Like, I use tools that let me draw the stuff, like inheritance diagrams, control flows, like uh, calls between functions, and that kind of things because I think very visually and, and that helps me understand the flow of a, of a transaction or an attack vector that I'm thinking about. Um, but in my humble and experience, I never found lots of value on running tools, right? All tools are just like complementary things to, to manual auditing, in my opinion. Their source, uh, other people might think differently and, and that's fine as well. My approach to working in a team. Um, do you find something like per programming but auditing useful? I tried per auditing sometimes. Uh, I didn't find it too valuable um, because I don't know, I'm reading code, you know? So it's kind of difficult to be speaking while I think about the code and sharing that with our, with our 
person and while the other person is speaking out something then it might kind of interrupt my line of thoughts um what i have found useful is in very specific part of a, let's say you are auditing a, a, in a team so for a very specific part of the code let's say a very difficult function or a function that is not clear to you it's very useful to get into a call with your peer auditors and do a line by line review like you explaining from the very top of the function you trying to explain what the function is intending to do and taking notes on the things that you cannot explain okay so you start like with the very definition of the function the name of the function you explain every single parameter you explain that is i don't know external function returns blah, blah 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 and line by line you go explaining to others what the function intends to do and what the function is, is doing why do you do that because in explaining things you realize about things that you don't understand and the things that you don't understand are the things that you should be focusing on because hopefully by the end of the audit you should have a very deep knowledge and understand every single part of the code right so by reading line by line a function trying to explain that to your to your fellows your fellows might have questions about it and in the process you will all be kind of gaining knowledge together about that very specific function and i think that's useful um in it has been very insightful many times for me. I think that's a very good thing to do. Um, and then for like for the most part of the audit, um, I like we would build and report together. We will have like broader discussions together. We will review each other's finding and everything. Um, but there's no like uh, every minute we are talking to each other in a team, right? There's lots. So perhaps you can spend a whole day just working along. I don't know. That's my approach to it. Um, well, another question. How do you ramp up on external things if there is an integration with them? How do you manage your time in this case? Yeah. It's not that easy. It's not that easy because sometimes um, when you have to do an audit, you're expected to be the, the expert that is auditing that, but you never uh, read that code or you are not that familiar with a code base or with that external integration. So it's quite difficult. And I feel that. Um, a good way of ramping up is taking some preparation time um sometimes that preparation time can be paid by your customers in some you can find a way to arrange that um sometimes it won't uh, so that means that perhaps i know you should spend two three four days whatever time it takes you to get familiar with external dependencies to get familiar with the context in which this system is about to be deployed um so that during the audit you will be more familiar with that and you can understand like better uh, different attack vectors that, that can come from those integrations. Um, when it comes to managing time around that, um, in many parts, you will just need to realize that those things might be out of scope. So in your audit report, you will probably just mention those integrations and you will say that those are external dependencies and you didn't audit them, those were, those were out of the auditing scope and you assume them to be working as documented and, and as, as, as intended by the developers um, at some point like in, in many ways you have to limit the scope of your audits um, and you should be clear about that in the audit report so some summary is two things one is uh, taking some preparation time like reading about those external things and the other uh, point is actually mentioning that in the audit report, saying that those things were out of the scope and you didn't audit them. Spallen is asking, what is the minimal time I request for an audit? Minimal time. Hmm. I would say it depends, right? Um, 
I wish I had a more concrete answer. Um, I really much it really much depends on the size of the code base. Um, some things you can audit, I know, in one or two days, but some things require you a month, right? Um, so estimation is not that easy. It's not that easy. I think there's some intuition about it, some experience. Um, I don't know. Um, never less than a day, right? Remember that you need to probably learn something, review something, and report something. I don't think you can do it in less than a day if you really are providing a sort of uh, security review. Um, but I don't know. I think that most audits you will find like at least a week. Uh, but again, depends on the size of the code. But one week could be okay. More questions, comments? What's the longest audit? <laughs> I think five weeks. Five weeks or six? No, no, I think I, yeah, I think there was, I think six. Yeah, I would say six. Uh, so that means month and a half, perhaps a little bit more. Sometimes you have to, in those very long audits, you have to sometimes move the, the delivery date a little bit forward, depending on how you did during the audit. Um, but yeah, there are many protocols that require lots of time. Um, there's one there's one audit that I remember. I think it's public, so so I can say it. Uh, we audited uh, optimism. There's the public report uh, that opens up and published at some point, and I was leading that, and and that took uh, probably you can read the report and and we say in there uh, how how many weeks it took, it took us, but um, that was probably one of the longest that I did. Huh. What is the thing you learned from your worst mistake? <laughs> line by line, really line by line. Um, I had my mistakes and uh, I think that in many ways I learned that sometimes you just have to grab a pen and paper and follow that function with pen and paper, you know, like do the variable assignments, do the math, do the for loop, do everything in very complicated functions. Uh, you should be taking things sometimes slower than you think necessary um, because there are issues in there. And, and with junior, when I started I know being a little bit more senior as auditor, um, I would only start trusting more junior auditors when, when I saw that they were really able or willing to do the, manual, the very manual thing when necessary. Um, I, I learned that many times, but not so many times, but I learned that. Um, what is the biggest missed issue? Honestly, like in audits that I participated in, like honestly, I don't remember one, like a very big, like critical issue that somebody stole money. I, I don't think so, no. Um, And usually we would work as as teams, right? We we never did uh, audits alone. I don't like auditing alone. I think that you should always be auditing, be auditing with someone else as, as much as you can. Um, so there's never like full responsibility on, on an individual when they do an audit, right? So it's the team. 
and um, luckily, I don't think I missed anything very big. Do you track missed issues? Uh, like at open when I when I was working at Open Sebling, I think at some point we missed. Uh, some things and um, definitely internally we will have like our uh, retrospectives and understand what went wrong and uh, understand what can we do better. Yeah, and that's super important. Like you will miss something at some point, um, but the thing is being able to uh, recover from that, learn from that and hopefully you don't make that mistake twice. I missed one question, which is, how do you get ready with a code waste for starting the audit? Do you clone the repo locally and set it up, run test? <laughs> no, uh, I definitely I clone everything uh, to, a developer, to a development environment. I cannot work on GitHub. Um, I compile things. That's could be like very basic, but sometimes the project that you need to audit does not compile. <laughs> so I compile things. Uh, you would run tests. If they have a test suite, like you would follow the instructions in the readme and try to run the tests. Hopefully they have lots of tests and the tests pass. If they don't pass, well, it's a bad start. Um, but yeah, taking things locally, uh, cloning everything, um, because I like taking like notes in the middle of the code. And sometimes I would develop my own my own scripts to test things locally. Um, so I like having my whole local setup for that. Uh, and I do care about existing tests and I do care about coverage. Um, sometimes by just skimming through a test, you can realize where are the parts that they are paying most attention to and where are the parts, parts that they are not testing too much or even the parts that they don't test. And it could be the case that there are functions, public functions that they don't test. And as an auditor, I would probably go look at them because they are not testing those, okay? So it's important looking at tests. I mean, you want to spend too much time, you are not auditing the tests, right? You just go through them quickly if you want. Um, what resources do you suggest for the learning and how to track the, this? These are lots of questions, I love this. Uh, what resources do you suggest for the learning and how to track test those learnings. My way of tracking learnings is building them vulnerable DeFi sometimes. Like I created them vulnerable DeFi out of learnings uh, that I had, like seeing hacks in, out there in the, in the space and realizing that they were repeating and repeating and repeating and repeating every single week. Uh, so I said, well, okay, let's document in some way these learnings in a fun way. So I created them vulnerable DeFi. Uh, so if you go to the vulnerable DeFi, you will find that lots of things are actual things that happen, uh, that happened like in the past. But a few weeks ago, we had an issue on mainnet that was actually very similar to a challenge of the vulnerable DeFi. So that's, I know that's a good way that I have of documenting things. I I have like personal notes on levels of the vulnerable DeFi that I want to build uh, out of the learnings that I had from reading write-ups and reading uh, vulnerability disclosures and that kind of things. Um, so for learning, I recommend reading uh, vulnerability disclosures, reading public reports that you find out there. Obviously you won't read every single report, but the most interesting ones are the critical issues in the reports. Um, reading the public reports of Immunify, of Code Arena, everything that you find out there of security firms uh, playing, capture the flags, um, that kind of things are useful. Block Dave is asking, are you focusing on any specific areas in Ethereum security right now? Yes, yes, yes. Um, I, I, after leaving Open Sebelin, I took some time off, but then I come back. I, I still want to contribute to Ethereum security. So I'm trying to understand how to contribute as an independent contributor or forming a, a group of people that we can contribute together to Ethereum security, but hopefully in a new way, okay? One that is more, uh, I don't know, aligned with the vision of Ethereum. Um, 
I won't give more details, but we, we are working on it. It's it's cool. Um, but yeah, we are. We, I'm still out there, like uh, doing some reviews, pack hunting, that kind of things. Education and other things. Uh, Spalen is asking, do you have any blogs for learning tracking that are viable, like Rect? Yeah, Rect is good. Uh, I like it. I like it kind of the the ironic approach they take sometimes. Um, there is this newsletter called Blog Threat Intelligence. Blog Threat. Mm. I think you can Google that. Um, that is written very well. There's lots of useful links in there. That's my kind of go-to resource to, to learn about news in the security industry. Um, so I, I very much like that. Ethi Wiki in Ethereum also has some security parts, uh, so a section where they post security links, sorry. So that's important. Um, I'm following like people on Twitter that are published, like security researchers that are publishing their findings and the write-ups in threads. I'm like following that as well. I'm on the um, Ethereum security telegram group. I think there's a Discord bridge as well. Uh, so being there, I'm like at least paying attention to the most important conversations and the links and the resources shared there in there. Um, I know probably lots of valuable resources that I'm missing, that I'm forgetting, but there's there's things out there. I will just stay silent if, unless there is any other question or comment or whatever you want to share. I even invite you to open the mic and say something if you want. Um, yeah, I don't know. It's been fun. Uh, I like being here. I like sharing these ideas. Um, yep. Okay, I'm I'm gonna jump in with one. This is engineer. Is there uh, yep. any mistake or a few mistakes that you see more junior auditors making frequently? Um, junior mis uh, okay mistakes junior auditors make. Huh. Um. A couple of ones. Like this is just my experience. Not necessarily <laughs> every junior auditor will make this. I, I I wouldn't even call them mistakes because they are junior and they're only starting out. Um, but I would say first, um, not paying attention to the whole picture of a system, meaning that they might focus just on this function on this contract and they will go like contract by contract, just thinking of a specific function and not understanding that some attacks might come from putting those things together, right? This function that calls this contract, this function, and there's these circumstances when there's happening, there's this thing happening on the system, right? So uh, I think that more senior writers have this ability of going to, to the very specific things, to the bigger picture things when it comes to understanding security threats and more junior auditors might be the case that they just focus on on this little thing which is fine but as they grow they should be paying attention to the whole picture um that's one another one i would say is um not paying the necessary attention to the reporting phase I would even dare to say that auditing is 50% finding a bug and 50% being able to report that bug. Um, the way in which we communicate and the reports that we write is uh, 
the way we showcase our work, right? The way we provide value to our customers, clients, developers, whatever. So junior auditors might be the case that they, are, they cannot fully express an attack vector in written English or, or the language that, that you're writing the reporting um, and being able to explain a complex technical thing in in a reasonable way, in a sensible way in which the developers then will be able to understand that. Um, so I would say those are the kind of the biggest two. I know there's not like, they are not very specific to solidity stuff, right? Um, but that kind of things can be learned very quickly. Uh, I think those, the ones that I mentioned about not seeing the bigger picture and not being able to communicate your fundings in a in a professional way that takes uh, more time and um, sometimes you can even tell the difference between senior and junior uh, when it comes to those not actually like whether you find a critical or not um what is the time do you what is the, do you think it takes going from junior to the <laughs> The auditor, um, I don't know, like depending on how much effort you put into it. Um, it's really good to to work on it, like to have a job being an auditor, like you're getting exposed every day to Solidity code and to the challenges of being an auditor. I think that's the best way of learning how to audit. Um, I would say no less than six months. Really. Also will depend on your background and uh, where you have some previous experience and everything. But I would say definitely uh, six months, one year. I think I would say even that after one year you have had uh, hopefully solid exposure to what does it mean to make a professional audit. Uh, yeah. Hmm, that's a good one. Do we need to have experience with Web2 security to become a smart contract auditor? Not necessarily, but I found by interviewing lots of, of people that those that have a background in Web2 security will already have the mindset, like the adversarial mindset of trying to find a, a security vulnerability in a system. And that's not that easy to teach, right? Um, so people that already come from a security background in some other stuff not related to smart contracts, um, it's usually the case that they can be faster in finding vulnerabilities of or thinking in adversarial ways to, to break a certain smart contract. Um, so that's, I think, lots of the value that that comes from having a background in Web2 security. Um, but definitely anybody can learn Solidity stuff and EVM stuff and Ethereum stuff. So definitely you shouldn't, uh, it's, it wouldn't be a, a mandatory to have a background on, on web2 but it's always helpful and as we start understanding that the security of applications built on top of ethereum is not only related to smart contracts but also goes well beyond that um, it might be the case that uh, people coming from web2 security will have an advantage over those that just solely focus on smart contract security because they will see the system as a whole and not necessarily just as a uh, solidity contracts. Uh, could you write in the comments the tools that you're using for drawing graph and visualizing the inheritance? So yeah, I mean, I use Miro just for making my own diagrams. Miro has nothing to do with um, smart contract stuff. It's just a tool to draw stuff. Um, it's similar to draw.io. Um, a little bit more professional, I'd say, but just it's just a thing that helps me instead of drawing on pen on paper my diagrams, I do it with Piro because I find it helpful. Um, but for a specific smart contract stuff, I think there's Surya uh, from Consensus. Yes, somebody's sharing that on the on the chat, and uh, Slither as well. 
I think that Slither can help you. Um, that's from Trail of Bits. So it really helps you draw some inheritance graph. And, and there's another work called Soul to UML. So Soul to UML also, if you come from a systems engineering background and are familiar with UML, um, this tool helps you and draw some UML diagrams, like uh, sequence diagrams and inheritance diagrams and that kind of things on smart contracts. So it can be helpful as well. And I think it even has a command to draw the storage layout of a contract that can be helpful. For instance, if you are auditing an, a system that has a vulnerability, usually like the storage layouts are very sensitive thing. So it's it's cool to do that, I don't know. Great. So I think we will cut things off here. Otherwise, we're going to keep Tincho and kidnap him for a few days, uh, which we don't want to do. So uh, thank you, everyone, for joining. I'm going to stop the recording now.